and awesome stuff and background. And I'd also like to hear what your first job was. And I mean your first job, not, you know, my first job was, you know, I was a uh, power broker. I want to talk to you about your first, first job, bagger, right? Landscaper, that's McDonald's. All right. By the way, Ben's first job, McDonald's made it one week. All right. <laughs> so let's kick it off. I want to start off with Russ Long, uh, founder and CEO of Long Capture out there in beautiful Colorado Springs, Colorado. By the way, I grew up in Colorado, nowhere near Colorado Springs. All right. Um, but Russ, you're doing great things with Sivir. But first, let's hear about your background. Okay. Former Air Force contracting officer, I was active duty for about five and a half years. Finished up this Space and Missile Systems Center. Uh, started this company to help small businesses figure out how to work with the government. So been at it about three years now. Uh, now a team of 25. We're remote, which I guess pretty much everyone is at this point. But we're all across the country. A lot of veterans and military spouses on the team. So first job, mowing lawns. So Mowing lawns. That's a good first job. That's a good first job right there. Like professionally or like like dragging one or house to house. Yeah, just around the neighborhood. I love it. I love it. All right. That's that's a good starter right there. Everyone just got nervous. They're like, crap, that's a good starter <laughs> job. All right. So uh, and then we have Christy McGarry from Second Front Systems, um, an amazing organization doing awesome stuff, executing in the cyber world and a bunch of other worlds. Um, and creating great products and delivering them to uh, DOD. Um, Chrissy is the VP and Chief of Staff. What does that mean? That means she has to do all the crap paperwork no one else wants to do, uh, which is processes and billing and hiring and firing. And, and oh, sounds miserable to me. But let's hear a little bit about you. And then we're all excited for that first job. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate it. Contrary to what you may believe with the chief staff role, I love it. It has been a lot of fun. Uh, I've been with Second Front now for the last two years. And um, yeah, like Ben had said, our um, here at Second Front, we are bringing innovative venture backed technologies uh, to pressing national security challenges. So uh, excited to talk about the cyber process. We have gone through phase one, two and three. And um, yeah, excited to join everyone here today. My first job, I was a waitress at a breakfast um, joint in South Bend, Indiana, where I was uh, born and raised. All right. All right. What, what was the starting wage? Oh my gosh. No, not tips. Like what was the actual yeah. wage? It was like $3 and like $3. See, that's what I'm talking about. Three dollars. <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty low, but the, the tips, yeah. And kind right. of it out. Well, hopefully South Bend treated you right and and did you right on the tips because three bucks, no one can live on three bucks. Come on. <laughs> All right, uh, our, ne our next guest is Bryce Lucan. Bryce is the COO of Moth and Flame. Named after one of the sickest metal songs ever <laughs> written in all time. That's that's the story I would tell if I worked for a, a company called Moth and Flame. Um, but they're doing great stuff in the commercial world. They're doing great stuff in the, the DOD world. They've learned how to leverage these different instruments we're going to talk about today. But uh, Bryce, why don't you tell us about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So started off my career uh, active duty for about 10 years. I was an acquisitions officer at SMC, working in uh, Mill SACCOM, both on the satellite and ground system side. Then spent the back half of my career at the Air Force Academy as an assistant professor of innovation, got to be there when Spark Cells were just kicking up with AFWorks uh, through Tony Perez. So I uh, was really, really excited to see, see that effort. Transitioned out and I've been in the commercial sector now uh, for about seven years, been doing uh, venture-backed startups. Uh, like uh, Ben mentioned, COO of Moth and Flame. Moth and Flame was founded in 2015, was mostly a media and entertainment uh, business doing 360 music videos for Taylor Swift. Then we got into doing uh, virtual reality and immersive technologies for Netflix, Google, Ram Truck, and some of the biggest brands in the world. And AFWorks came knocking at our door at South by Southwest, and that brought us into the cyber world. And so now, since then, we've gone through phase one, phase two, and have multiple phase three contracts out there delivering for, for the DOD customer while we keep our commercial side uh, alive as well. 
uh, my first job, I moved irrigation pipe in bean fields in uh, California. So 30, 30 foot long bean, uh, 30 foot long uh, pipes of uh, steel moving irrigation in California. Football coach made us all do it because he felt like it would make the team stronger. So yes. it uh, was, was directed to us as our first job. Hey, that's fantastic. Everyone has those first jobs. I say jobs because I unfortunately I had multiple. I told you McDonald's was only a week. Um, first jobs make you appreciate later jobs. Yeah. So, uh, so remember that. Remember that. All you know, all that that pipe lifting uh, <laughs> set you up for this success. All right. Um, before we move on to Rich, uh, Bryce, name one Taylor Swift song, please. Oh, uh, the one that we did was with the glass shattering. Uh, all I remember is all the special. People. What was it, Chrissy? Bad blood. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that, that one, in terms of the, the, the effects, the special effects we did was, was a hit. All right. All right. Next time you'll be ready. Next time you'll be ready. You'll be like, I can't pick one, Ben. Here's a list of 30. <laughs> right. All right. And so last, certainly not least, and our resident PIA expert today um, is Rich Birchfield. Rich is the executive director of Catalyst Campus, also in Colorado Springs. Um, by the way, you know, Catalyst Campus is one of those premier organizations that does what it does. There have been a lot of groups that have popped up since Catalyst Campus that, that allege to work in the PIA environment. Maybe we'll talk about them today. Um, that simply do not measure up to Catalyst Campus. And by the way, I, I own no equity in Catalyst Campus. Um, <laughs> I just love what they do. All right. And so, Rich, why don't you tell us about our, yourself and, 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 and what you got going on there at Catalyst Campus? Sure. Thanks, Ben. Um, so I'm a guy who spent uh, just a little, a few months, less than 30 years in the Air Force. Uh, space ops was, uh, was my background. Um, part of that was in the reserves. So I was able to spend about 18 years in industry. Um, so coming in and out of uniform for quite a while and even took a break from all that and was part of the Colorado Springs Chamber in EDC. So uh, great appreciation for my hometown that I now claim after growing up an entire life in the Air Force uh, and seeing what things are like from those lenses. So when the opportunity our founder and owner, the lenses I come with really come from, uh, you know, what the community sees what industry sees, what our warfighters see, certainly from a joint and interagency perspective. So um, it's been very cool, but most important, you know, we've got two beautiful daughters. Um, the campus to me is just a snapshot of how good it can be when you meld industry, academia, the warfighter, and some of those really key partnerships that people forget about together, um, where both industry and the warfighting community benefit from each other. Lots of opportunity to uh, transfer uh, technology. Um, people are going to hear Kamar talk about the accelerator. She is just an unbelievable rock star in what she does and the way she creates community. So it's it's uh, very cool to be part of the hippest uh, gig in town uh, that certainly has a, an impact on uh, I'd say on a national scale. And seeing you know friends like Russ, uh, Bryce, Chrissy, I mean teammates that you know we ourselves continue to see working together. Uh, just you know it's one collective group you know knocking out of the park together just happened to be at the hippest place in town. So uh, no complaints. And so my first job jobs uh, were a combination of, of course, McDonald's, because most of us started there. Um, and uh, also cutting grass throughout the entire neighborhood. And even I even gave, uh, and this is in Omaha, Nebraska. So even gave detasseling corn a shot that lasted about a day. And I thought I was going to die. So uh, that, that ended quickly. Then I just stuck to sports and cutting yards. So. All right. All right. So what I love about that is despite the fact that you guys all have titles like CEO, chief of staff, COO, executive director, you're actually people. It's unbelievable. You're actually real people um, who had to, had to do jobs that real people do, right? Um, and you've made it to where you, where you have because of your drive and, and your ambition and, and your talent. Um, but... Today is about giving away all that drive and ambition and talent to all the folks that tuned in. That If I was tuning in right now on a cyber program, I'd be like, I want to get in and hear how the experts can tell me where to get money. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of nice ways to say that. I want to know how I can support the national security operation. Like, there's a lot of nice ways to say that. And those are all very important things. But at the end of the day, you have a product or service. 
you think DOD is a good customer and you want to get money, right? You want to develop that. You want to get investment. You want to develop that. And so today is really about that. It's about where's the money? How do I get to it? What do I use it for? Do I even want to do business with DOD? By the, by the way, that should be a question every, every company should ask themselves and really think about first. Do I even want to get involved in this mess? And, and these folks will help you navigate it. But today it's really about the why, the money, the big picture. Um, for those folks who are like, wow, I was hoping this was going to be a nuts and bolts and in this, you know, the crew was going to write my proposal for me. Um, there's people on this call that will write your proposal for you, but you got to reach out to them. That's not this webinar. Okay. All right. So for this webinar, we're going to talk about Cibber. We're going to talk about partnership intermediate agreements, which are about tech transfer. Don't get fooled for you DOD folks on the phone who all want to pee. Up. They're about tech transfer. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that too, but let's start with some broad questions and kind of go around um, just so people have some background between Chrissy and Russ and Rich and, and Bryce. We have folks that help other folks on the cyber program. We have folks who have worked the cyber program from the government side. We have folks who have their company has executed on phase one, two, and three of cyber. This, this group runs the whole gamut of the cyber program. All right, three billion dollars, right? So, so this group has has the intel on on what you need. So, if you're going to fire questions, please fire questions at me. There's like a million of you on the phone, so we probably will answer zero of them. But um, send them anyways, and and if I see a good one, I'll, I'll zing somebody. Um, all right, so let's start. Um, I want to start with with Bryce because I want to talk about a little higher level piece about being a commercial company. And then seeing the, the defense side and saying, hey, we might want to get involved in the defense side. How the hell do we start? Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how a company like Moth and Flame would even end up on in defense work? Yeah, no, absolutely. It starts with trying to make the business case for from the company side is why why would you want to do business with the government? And, you know, prior to really the AFWorks uh, cyber process, really the open topic, it was doing large proposals on source, source, source or uh, doing uh, source selections, which I got to do in my Air Force career. And I wanted to stay 100 miles away from that from, from a commercial side because uh, you know who you're going up against, right? Uh, those large incumbents. And so Sibber offered us the opportunity to not only have uh, a fast way into the market of, of DOD, but also a protected way with the kind of sole source non-compete around our, around our technology. And so that that was really kind of the essence and the nexus for for kind of the value proposition to actually propose something into the government with our with our commercial tech that we were using with our Fortune 500 customers, and it, it made it really really easy. And then focusing on all right, what are the the steps in the evolution? Because a phase one is a nice nice, but it still doesn't make the business case for the commercial company. It's how do I get to phase two and then really with the goal of being phase three, where I have a sustaining customer um, through through the Air Force or other DOD customers. And that process is compressing it down with, with AppWorks and the Cibber process to less than a year beats any you know, source selection timeline. And so that made the, the resource investment on our side make make a lot of sense. And so it's it's been been a great process. And so that's really what we focused on and we were able to sell that up to our board of directors and our shareholders and, and investors, uh, which is really, really who you have to sell to and you're accountable to, to, to make it happen. Yeah, that's great. And so, so some of the questions that are already coming in, which, which by the way, like uh, Cibber is one of the programs for everyone that's on here right now. Cibber is one of the very few DOD programs that has too many resources. Okay. There are videos, there's a million companies, that there's all sorts of folks. You go to the SBA site, it has possibly one of the best government front ends you'll ever see in terms of what information you can get on Cibber. So, so for folks that are interested, honestly, go to the SBA website and start and get smart first before you engage you know, one of the folks here on, on this call. But at the very base, the Small Business Innovation Research Program and, and the STTR, which is the university technology transfer side of this program, is an SBA program. And then there are, there are I think there's 13 um, of the agencies 
can participate in the program, DOD being the biggest and one of the participants. And basically, the SBA gives us money, gives DOD money, right? And SBA gives DOD money and says, okay, we'll give you this big pot of SIBR money, provided that you run a SIBR program. And then there's some rules and some policies that come from SBA. And then DOD executes the SIBR program because they get money for it and they're able to invest in the stuff they want. The second piece I saw in here is very interesting, uh, a question we had from someone um, on, you know, how come there's these topics that come out and it doesn't seem like there's a, a definite phase three requirement, All right? And so, I, and this is a question that the panelists talked about before, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pawn it over to somebody. But I can tell you that five years ago, Sivers did have a very defined deliverable to a program manager that you could name in the lab. And guess what? You only got two or three people to offer because the technology was already defined by the government. There was nothing innovative about the innovative research. It was, hey, I need a new part. This is the part. Who can make it? Do it as a sibber. The customer's there. The invention of the open topic, all props to the Air Force on the open topic, is, is the concept of technology moves too fast for me to sit there and figure out what it is and then define it and then tell someone to make it for me. We need to just find out what's out there. The rub is that you got to find a customer, but that's where groups come in that are great at that. And so now I'm going to kick it over to Russ at Long Capture. Russ, this is the problem. Folks want to bid on the open topic, but they don't know who the end user is. They don't know what the long play is. How do you help? How do I help? Okay. You know, I said the long play. I just made that up. <laughs> Point it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I guess with a lot of us having a bit of military background um, in my company, that's really the first thing that we take a look at is when folks come in. Uh, I think a great example, like we've seen technologies all over the place um, from diet apps and fitness apps all the way up to small satellites and uh, propulsion systems for launch vehicles. So, a lot of folks don't realize the, the wide range of different needs uh, that the Air Force and the Department of Defense have. So, you know, diet apps, there's fitness requirements, there's a, a lot of manpower issues because we lose a lot of airmen uh, to not meeting fitness standards and not, you know, having a good diet. So there is fit for all these different kinds of technology uh, with, within the Air Force. So um, it really just comes to doing a lot of Google searching. Uh, I think Ben was talking about search engines earlier. Uh, Googling. Lycos. Lycos is what we're <laughs> talking about, not Googling. Googling didn't exist at the time. <laughs> we're taking a look to see, you know, is talking to some veterans, talking to some different, uh, even active duty members, if you know them, to say, hey, you know, do you have any ideas of where this might fit? Because um, there is just a broad, range of technology needs that the Department of Defense has that many companies, many tech startups don't realize that it is a potential customer and there is a great fit for their technology. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and, and so, you know, companies like yours, and, and I know there's a few others out there, um, are, are very good at um, being that gap, right? Because the, you know, the issue is that, right? We went to this open topic method. And it is a better method for getting access to the new technologies quicker because there's just not time to research what they are on the government side. Um, you know, for my background, if people don't know, I spent all my career on the on the government side after McDonald's. And and you know, my experience was running the the cyber program from the from from my lab from the government side. And our we saw the evolution of it. We this was army, we didn't evolve as fast, you know, hey, breaking news. Um, but we saw that evolution of, hey, we're going to go out, we're going to post these topics, we get some topics in. Hey, we're not getting cool new stuff. How come nobody's, you know, soliciting for cool new stuff? We don't know what the cool new stuff is. We need someone to tell us who the what the cool new stuff is. And so that open topic opens it up. The problem that it creates in which companies like yours and, and others on the phone and other companies out there who are very good at it, have, have identified that, hey, we can, you show them what the good technology is, we can go find who those customers are and then marry them up. And um, and so then that's a great service. That's a great service. All right, 
So great questions coming in um, along the right side. I lied and said I was going to answer them, and we're just like plowing through them. So um, we'll keep doing that if you want to throw your questions in there. Shout out to Netscape and Alta Vista. I love it. Uh, hashtag back in the day. So, uh, Rich, um, before we go to Christy, who's going to bring it home on kind of the three phases, start taking notes now. Um, I want to take a, a foray here into, into PIA because – um, Pia, which was very popular 20 years ago, right. It, to support tech transfer programs. No one, I can tell you, I had never heard of it in acquisition. And then in the last five years, oh, everyone's got to have a Pia. You got a Pia? No, but you got to have one, man. What, what would you do with it? I have no idea, but someone else has one. And that means I need to have one. Right. And that, that's the DOD way. Um, but Catalyst Campus is kind of setting that standard out there. There's a there's a couple other groups that are really good too. Um, I whenever I talk PI, I always give shout out to Navy Crane Tech Transfer Office. They're they're amazing. So shout out to the Navy. Um, but tell me a little bit about about PIA, people's misunderstanding, and and what I'd like to hear about is what's the interface of PIA and this Cyber program? I mean, they're not a direct interface, but but how do you how do you assist each other with having Cyber and PIA running? Sure. Well, Ben, if it's okay with you, I'll talk about the PIA, but then um, you know, Russ is really a oh, pro. hey, Rich, that's not your fault. That, that was technologically challenged, Ben. I muted you. That was oh, me. <laughs> I just gave you the answer right in there, so you didn't catch that. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, if it's okay, um, I'll cover the PIA part. But uh, Russ is a He's a great friend. He's a teammate here in town. Um, and I think he could offer some great insight to that connective tissue between the PIA and the SBR, if if, if Russ is cool with that. Um, you know, the PIA, so for the baseline for us at Catalyst Campus, our PIA is with Air Force Research Lab, RV, um, Space Vehicles Director down in Albuquerque. Um, and, and I'll tell you, in developing a vehicle like that, and Ben, I know you'll appreciate this too, the relationship behind it, you know, the professional part, the friendships with the folks you're working with, for us in the case of uh, uh, Gabe Mounts and his team down at Albuquerque, the folks on the con side of the house, um, you know, even the JAG side and all that. I mean, those relationships are key um, to finding success in creating it, let alone executing it, uh, because it gives you a ton of flexibility and allows us to on-ramp uh, very quickly. So, um, okay, so, you know, you're coming from Army. We've got Army folks here on the campus that are able to use that vehicle for the on-ramping part. And then we look for a longer term vehicle. We're working with um, Navy Aegis out on the East Coast. We're working with NYWIC PAC on the West Coast. So now we've got our, our teammates in Khaki being a part of this too. Um, we've got a wide variety of different companies that either through the CIBR or tying directly or through that are tying into the P to allow them to onboard quickly. Uh, we've, and we've got a lot of flex with that. And I think what that does is that matches up with the ecosystem of Catalyst Campus where we're trying to move quickly. You know, some of you may have heard about this guy named Rob Slaughter. Um, Rob, you know, moves at the, he thinks at the speed of light and you better hang on to your hat and keep up with that pace. And then you throw Nick into the equation and he's, Nick is willing to lean in and let's get her done. So they're even looking at creating one at the DOD level, which I think will provide more flexibility and um, dare I say, drive a Mack truck through it. But that's what we need right now because, um, you know, just listening to what you said earlier, Ben, and those of us who grew up in the business, you start to throw in, and it's not a knock, it's it's a culture that I see a lot of people, just like on the Air Force side under General Holt, who are trying to change the culture to move quicker for our cons folks to understand at the beginning of the whole process, they are at, they are at the tip of the spear, as quick as they can move. That's how quickly we can create an atmosphere like this to create capability to deliver to the warfighter. Um, and in this case, the Cal's campus, like you said earlier, it's about transitioning technology both ways. It needs to be a win-win. And so through that, through initially the relationship with the partnership. So, you know, we are the nonprofit partner that this is built for with the active duty side, which happens to be RV. Um, they have been great about thinking jointly, which is so key because in today's world, we all know you, you can't do this as a single service. Uh, and, and it's so cool that we have become this purple environment and quite frankly, become an interagency environment. And that's where the PIA gives us flexibility and glad to talk about, like you said you know, earlier, glad to talk details about how does that work. You don't create them in the blink of an eye. I wish so much we could say we did that. But those relationships at the very beginning, 
where you build the trust, you understand the whys and the hows, and you make sure that the folks from the finance, the cons, everyone else understands that how they play into it, you build momentum, you build excitement of why they are so important to this. Um, it took us a little bit of a lead time to get it going, but now that we've got it, um, the pace is pretty relentless when you bring in all the different services, industry, academia, being a part of that too. And all of a sudden though, this melting pot is, is, uh, is boiling hot because everyone's jumping in. And at the end of the day, to me, it's about capability. Uh, and just on a side note, like with Catalyst Campus, for those who got to hear Kevin speak yesterday, you know, his vision gave us this, the capacity of this beautiful campus. And we'd even like to see it grow outside of our state. That capacity grave gave the space to create capability. And now that with the model, how the model has changed because of the help of the PIA and how quickly we can bring people on board, people want to be a part of the capability, whether it's Kamar's Accelerator, whether it's what's going on with Space Camp or Platform One, or some worldwide exercises we're running with a program called Sprint Advanced Concept Training that what I just talked about, they're part of it too. Um, that's what happens with this vehicle that gives us that flexibility. So it sounds like a Cinderella story and minus, you know, some, some initial ramping up of everyone understanding the why. Um, I mean, we're breaking glass like nobody's business. We couldn't do without the PIA. The one thing I would say to everyone online though, that's a great element of a portfolio. PIA also requires state funding, which we have a great relationship with our state legislature and the Office of Economic uh, Development International Trade helps us in that regard because you've got to have that balance. Otherwise, you can't keep it alive. Uh, working with partners like Russ helps us see other ways we can expand our portfolio. So I would tell everyone, man, it is a great anchor to it, but be flexible, be diverse in your, your financial portfolio so that you can you can stand the ebbs and flows as the ship you know gets tossed around a little bit. But man, it has been awesome to have in our portfolio. Oh, well, that's fantastic. And it really is a, a premier. I, I love that we're getting shouts to Gabe Mounts. All right. And I'm going to throw a couple other shouts out to Lieutenant Wahidi um, and to Ryan Connell. He likes to pronounce it Canal, but that's garbage. No one pronounces the name that way. So we're not doing it on this webinar. Um, and so, but I'm happy they're tuning in because the question for a lot of the industry folks is, is and we're seeing in the chat here is, Hey, great. I get it. I'm on the webinars. I go to the trainings. I'm on the SBA website. I get it. I do the research. And then the contracting officer I'm engaged with has no clue what I'm talking about. They don't know what a P is. They don't know what a phase three is. Um, and, and honestly, I, this is a personal experience for me, having only been on the industry side for a short time. I've run into this three or four times already in just a, a few months of a person saying, Oh, you want to do a sole source contract? Where's your JNA? You know, we're going to, we're going to go through the far part 15 negotiated process. It's like, this is a cyber phase three. You don't need any of that garbage. Um, and, but whether, whether you legally need it or not, you have to train that government person to understand what it is. So it's like double responsibility for industry to train them and then help work, walk them through the process. Um, and it is unfortunate, um, but it is persistent. Um, and so that, that gets me down to another question. We're going to, we're going to hit up Chrissy. I'm going to blast you with the hard one. You're getting the hard one. All right. So, so we've talked a lot about the open topic. Um, and so what's important to me, and I think this came out of our conversation earlier about the open topic, um, is that the open topic is, is getting a whole bunch of new people to come and consider, uh, Air Force or whoever they're supporting with the open topic, soon to be Army here, um, is getting them to come to the table because they can kind of have some leeway to say, hey, this is what I make and I think there's some application for it. And let me tell you about the application. Um, at the same time, you know, there was a study, study that came out uh, last month uh, showing that new entrants are down. And so, and so we've got this dichotomy of we got a lot of programs that are really ramping up to try to bring in new entrants. Overall, the numbers look down. My opinion is that we just need to throw more money at programs like Open Topic because they're not big enough to withstand the consolidation on the on the, the you know the big the big Army, big Navy, big Air Force uh, piece of it. Um, just just Ben's wild opinion. No facts behind that. Um, but some companies are coming to it because of this structure. Right. Mm -hmm. so the second front. So why don't you tell us about your story and how second front came to uh, to leverage Cibber all the way through all three processes. 
<laughs> yeah, so thank you, Ben. I do want to uh, reiterate how Ben uh, introed me at the beginning too, though. So I do work at a company where everyone does come with a military, national security and contracting background. In fact, everyone here on the panel, except for me, comes from that background. I come from the commercial background. In fact, a sales one. So I bring those value to, values to my company as a whole, and that's what I try to implement as a Silicon Valley defense startup. So again, all of the, the details cyber related, contracting, full source, et cetera, that's where I'd lean on my fellow panelists. But um, to Ben's point, these past two years of having worked with the government from the commercial sales perspective, um, there nothing. There doesn't really seem to be anything too logical about it. Uh, to what Ben was saying, uh, just to you know, reiterate it some more. No one really knew how to purchase. They didn't have an idea of the actions or the process that and, and what those could bring. No one wants to take on the accountability, the risk, and try something new. The list kind of went on, and there was something from the commercial sales perspective that did stick out, and it is the Silver program. And the reason why is because um, it, it just seems to be a good process and it's one that we have set ourselves up against um, and we have run alongside um, and it's been successful for us, right? We've been through phase one, two, and three. And the way that AFWorks is running it now partnering with platform one, it, it makes perfect sense to go about it. In that. So, um, just making sure I didn't get cut out there. I heard a funny note. Um, so in phase one with AFWRC specifically, uh, so you get 50K, right, if you're awarded. And that helps underwrite your business development expenses to find an Air Force customer who does care about what you're offering. So um, if they're giving you this, then you can engage as a tech company and you can put in the business development effort to truly search and identify and find that customer fit. So you're continuing to iterate on um, what it is that you're building from an engineering perspective and then how you actually pull on those resources to improve your sales efforts. Um, so that just kind of sets you up for success and propels you forward. I believe someone, what I, Rich was saying, uh, how do you accelerate through? I would say once you get through that phase one and you get that, and, and if you partner you know, along with someone like AFWorks, like it really does push you forward. So the open topic was to, to our benefit. Um, and then the other thing, right, is you have two sides of the coin when you're operating as a SaaS company. You are trying to quickly sell the product to the market space, right, to the, to the government. And you're trying to quickly get your product out into the market, create that feedback loop and iterate on your product to meet those government needs. So as you get into the um, phase two and you start iterating on it, you just gain, you continue to just gain more and more traction. So then when you become a phase three, to Ben's point earlier, you don't have to worry about the maneuvering of special funds or special silver funds here or there because you, you're considered a phase three company and it's a little bit easier to um, engage and continue to, to interact. I'm going to stop there because I know, Bryce, you've gone through this as well. Is there anything you think that I've missed or anything you think I should highlight? No, no. I think the initial case of where you, I like the words you use there, underwriting your business development effort. As I'm watching just the channel over here, a, a chat of folks asking, well, how do you actually find mm -hmm. the customers and sell in? That initial 50K does hedge your bet as a commercial company to spend the resources and people's time and effort canvassing the Air Force and finding out. I mean, I get it, it's it's hard to actually reach out to, to the customer compared to what you mm -hmm. do maybe in commercial sales, but uh, being able to take take that risk and, and dig in, you can find find the right, right folks. Um, and the, the last piece I would say that based again on what I'm seeing over here in the chat based on like, well, where are the requirements? Mm -hmm. Well, the approach here of uh, the customer doesn't always know exactly what they need. I think it was Henry Ford that said, if I ask my customers what they want, it's a faster horse, right? And so I know for a lot of the technology that Moth and Flame brought from the media and entertainment side, people have not seen it before, right? And then once they saw it and were exposed to it, then the requirement definition started, started 
the engine in their head started coming to fruition of, oh, here's the use cases I can do it. So it's much more of a a push push based strategy that AppWorks has, has taken and been able to thwart some of that risk for the commercial company by making it a faster process and giving you some cash flow up front to, to get started. I think we lost Ben, our, mo yeah. our moderator, so now we're just four wandering. And the other thing I'd say, and, and all three of you, I think, can attest to this and maybe relate to it as well, is as you're going out there and you're searching for, you know, the right fit of a customer, it's two sides, right? It's it's the work of meeting the requirements as, as the company going out there looking for the government customer, but it's also asking the right questions of the government customer as to whether or not they wanna partner with you alongside the timeline and the trajectory of, of how you wanna set yourselves up and set them up ultimately for success because they're the ones use, utilizing your products. So the more upfront you can be to make sure to showcase um, those requirements and then to engage with the customer to really get a good understanding of where they're at from a timing perspective, capabilities perspective, et cetera, it will only help accelerate it more. And what's great is I think the super process really helps align with that um, and keeps you kind of true to making sure that you really are finding the perfect mesh, right? Um, at least that's been, that's been our experience, right? Is people understanding where we are as a startup, where we are in our funding, where we are when um, with our actual capabilities and what still needs to be built out and how we're gonna use the funds, et cetera. So the more transparent you can be, I think the the better off. And, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's where Russ and Rich come in is helping um, make, making sure that you, you know, hit all of those points and cross those T's and dot those I's uh, to you know maximize your um, awards. Yeah, so I want to throw out a question, I think for Bryce and Chrissy. So, you know, going, rewinding the clock to two and a half years ago, there wasn't an AppWorks open topic. Um, SBIR was kind of done the same way uh, for many, many different years. Um, we've seen a lot of changes. And so when I got started, when I first started you know, talking about the SBR program, working with it, uh, VCs weren't interested, uh, tech startups weren't interested. And actually I'd heard a lot of comments from investors where if a company had an SBIR, then they weren't interested in investing in that company. So I think we've seen a lot of changes uh, to the program in just the last two years, um, primarily through AppWorks. So I wanna talk about, you know, from Bryce and Chrissy, you know, how have you found this program beneficial, but then also what are some of the challenges that still remain? So Brett, <laughs> I'll switch to. Yeah, <laughs> just off as well. All right, Bryce. Yeah, I can, yeah I, can, I, can, I can kick that one off. And one thing I didn't mention in my intro is I'm still, still a reservist uh, at the Pentagon in the Joint Reserve Directorate. And there they're actually looking at how does the government play nicer with technology companies and the venture capital markets to ensure that there's good capital flows uh, and those aren't being infringed on for, for the early stage companies when they do business with the government. Because typically there's been a mantra, even in the Valley, of, oh, you do you do business with the government, they, some of the VC firms will kind of, kind of step away. But there's some interesting ones out there. I'll throw out one just uh, by name, Harpoon. Uh, they've they've done um, a lot of VC investment in in cyber cyber style companies, and what what you have to be able to communicate in the cyber process is showing how you as a company for those investors you're getting from phase one into phase two. VCs they're smart they understand that that's R and D that's one off one time revenue. How do you get to phase three and show that the Air Force the Army or the Navy is a sustaining kind of a sustaining customer, right? Okay. And so that's that's really how you that that phasing process is the most effective way uh, to to be able to sell it back into into your investor base, um, and that's where you can generate the long longer term contracts that get you the the higher valuations. Exactly, and that's kind of how we or that is how we positioned ourselves at at Second Front, um, Bryce. And we did exactly that, uh, going through the process getting, you know, building the product, getting it out there, iterating on it based off of the feedback the government was able to give us to then, you know, raise and close our seed round in the last, in the last two months. Um, so I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more there. Yeah, and I think Russ, when you asked 
kind of what's you know, what are the kind of the hurdles or, or roadblocks as well as kind of the gains. You know, AFWorks has, has made it so that the VCs can have been able to match or come in and participate in the cyber process. So companies have taken advantage of that. I think that's definitely a positive thing where the VCs have seen leverage now to their capital. I put in a dollar and additional leverage is coming in on the deal with me. They like that. Um, also, they like it. What our, our company strategy was was not to take uh, the next round of investment as we came into government business, but hold off till we built the business with the government and use that to show long term traction and sustainability in that in that customer base and those revenues. And so there's really kind of two strategies there that, that, that a company can can take and AFWERKS and the cyber process is opened up in a way to allow uh, for that level of participation. Cool. And I want to try and connect a couple of dots here because Rich was talking about PIAs, IVC, mm -hmm. uh, Platform One, and you know, this whole theme today. So uh, with the PIA, we've really been able to leverage SBIRs. So we set up the PIA, you know, Cat Catalyst has been executing, running accelerators, doing some really cool stuff, leveraging that tool. And then, for example, they'll run the accelerator, bring in a bunch of commercially focused companies who may not have worked with the Department of Defense or Air Force before. And a lot of times the tool that we're using on the back end of those accelerators and these different innovation efforts is to go after these SBIR, um, especially AFWorks open topics. Uh, so that has been a huge avenue to really uh, take a lot of these innovation efforts to the next, le next level. And the same uh, can be said for platform one. We've, you know, they're trying to bring in a lot of different commercial talent and expertise software developers. So SBIR has been a huge tool either to get some initial funding and just provide some bodies and some time to get some traction working with the government, providing that solution uh, to the Department of Defense. And then from there, um, you know, jump into phase three is have that sole source ability. I wanted, considering getting into a conversation with uh, Ben about other transactions and sole source and stuff, but we won't, we won't dive into that because we lost must have been on to harass him. He used to do a bunch on OTAs. Um, and real quick, so that that's I think kind of ties the pieces together. Um, SBR has been a huge tool for Catalyst, for the PIA, for Platform One to really bring in industry uh, and, and get them traction to start working with Department of Defense. Uh, the other piece, I've seen a couple different questions, both on kind of the government side. Uh, and on some, I think, primes that are looking to partner on SBIR. So AppWorks, you know, especially through this open topic, I think has published a list on their website of all the companies that have won uh, a phase one contract. So that means they have the sole source ability. Um, they've at least you know, done their registrations or are a little familiar with how to do business with the government. Um, but that list is out there on the AppWorks site. That's at least one starting point to find other companies to potentially partner with or that you can easily leverage and bring into your, your programs of record or whatever it, it might be. Um, so that's all, I'm, I'm, I'm off my soapbox. So Bryce or Rich, is there anything else, or Chrissy, any, anything else you wanna add to that or any other topics that you really wanted to hit on today that we didn't get into? I think we hit on a lot of things. Again, to everyone, um, if there are any specific things you want to review in regards to um, the details and the minutia of going through Sivers, sole soul source justification, et cetera, that's where, where Russ and Rich come into play. Uh, you know, Bryce with the military background as well is, is extremely familiar with it. Uh, mine is more, again, the, the commercial perspective and why it makes sense to partner um, and move forward with with an AppWorks and a Platform One as as you go through a cyber process. Um, but unless we've got anything else from the panelists, I know we've got Molly and Daniel Holter coming up next, which we're all excited about. Um, but guys, anything else? I guess my I'll I'll use my closing thought to actually answer somebody's question that I know is didn't go. Rick Boyd over there at. Uh, how do we point our government POCs to understand how to utilize phase three contracting capability? I think this brings up a, a broader broader point. Um, as a cyber company, you have to actually become an expert uh, or work with folks like, like Russ, Rich, Chrissy that are experts to get educated. 
because the government is big. Not everybody knows how to use everything that's available to, to them. Um, so I will, I will tell you, even as the contractor, we've had to play the game of educator, uh, mm -hmm. even with uh, not necessarily the end user, the direct customer, but everybody in the big process um, along the way. So, so Rich, it's it's a it's an education game that you you have to pit, play understand where those resources are and the professional and the memos are are published and send those to to uh to uh your pocs uh and your customers to help them understand how to leverage because it will be there'll be a knowledge gap uh typically because it's still very very new to the organization of the government and the air force as a whole so you got to be the smartest in the room as the company uh to get the deal done Bryce or um, Russ, anything? No, I already went off on my soapbox. I'm trying to. <laughs> no. Well, thanks everyone again for joining. We are going to pass it back to Molly Kane here again. Um, Daniel Holter coming up, and um, yeah, please reach out to us. Oh, there's Molly. Hello. You're back. Uh, yeah, yeah, please reach out to us. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Appreciate your time. Um, I apologize for all the technical difficulties. I know you guys were seeing uh, Chrissy make ins and outs appearances, and then we we'll totally lost Rust, and, or not Rust, Rich, and then Ben disappeared halfway in the middle. Um, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rust. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you, Chrissy. You guys are awesome. Um, and you can hit the leave button. I know. Um, did you guys give your contact info? Everybody knows how to get a hold of you. You I posted in mine. In the, yeah, I posted in the chat. Very cool. Um, thank you again for your time, and uh, hope hope everybody can stick around. We have two tracks coming up, and I think Daniel is going to join me. Once I get it, okay. Uh, let me let me peek backstage and see if Daniel is hopping in. All right, um, next up, you guys, we've got the idea hack. If you're not familiar with it, oh, perfect timing. Hello, Daniel. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you, sorry. I'm like dealing with technical issues in the, in the back. <laughs> the, story, the story of Tuesday is totally fine. Um, all right, so I am going to, Daniel, would you like to tell the room? We've got about 250 folks. I'm sure we'll have a lot more as they come in. Um, but do you want to talk a little bit about the idea hack? And then I'm going to send you, when you're done with that, I'm going to send you over into the left side of the screen where it says sessions. So if anybody is planning on joining the idea hack, that's where Daniel is headed. All right, yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel, um, and we are doing an idea hack. The idea being that we're going to spend, I think it's going to be four hours, exploring the idea of how we can uh, modernize how software is purchased and licenses are procured in the DOD. Um, and what that's going to look like, I'm sharing my uh, Miro board here really quick is it's going to be about four hours of exercises where we are a little bit of warm up to get everybody into the right headspace. We're going to look at all of the potential stakeholders who are involved in that. Is my screen mirrored, by the way, behind me? Or is it looking mm -hmm. normal to you? Yep, I can see. You look, oh, it's good. Cool. Yeah. Um, we're going to be looking at kind of the underlying problems and assumptions and mental models that cause the problem to be the way that it is. We're going to converge on some how might we statements um, to, to figure out what are some different avenues that we could get after this. And then we're going to come up with some ideas for what might uh, solve this through, through a couple of different avenues. Then we're going to break out into Jitsi rooms. Um, which are just small chat rooms where people can refine those ideas. This will not be a pitch. There is no um, there there is no maintenance of intellectual property. This is just people sharing ideas for how to get after this problem. Um, it it might be unlike anything you've done before. It kind of 
it pulls from a number of different disciplines, human-centered design, design thinking, and uh, facilitated discovery exercises. So if you're interested, it's gonna be a few hours of just uh, dropping sticky notes on the board. It's gonna be fun. There will be music in the background. Um, and we, we look forward to having you there. Awesome, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, I see that we've already got people joining the sessions. So pop over there if you guys wanna hang out with Daniel for lunch um, and then uh, participate. You'll be joining teams. It'll be a really good time. Daniel is an awesome facilitator. So I look forward to popping in and seeing how it goes, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Bye. We'll see, we'll see how this works technical wise, moving you over to sessions. Do we know how that's happening? How I nope, that worked. Okay. That was like a giant shepherd's hook. That was that was great. Um all right. So Kelsey. Do I have you and Ben? Oh, I, hey I Kelsey. Think I'm here. Hello. <laughs> I think I think you're here too. It's good to see you. And then Ben, there you are. Hello, right. sir. It's good to see you guys. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am just going to go ahead and hand the reins over to you because it's already twelve oh one. Ben. Uh, well, so we've got Kelsey from Google and we've got Ben from D2IQ and I'm just gonna let you guys run with it. Perfect. All right, enjoy. Wow. I'll see thanks you in a little bit. Bye. Hey everybody, um, thanks so much for, uh, for joining these uh, next four part session that we have. Um, this is a four part session where we're just gonna be talking about um, doing open source. Um, uh, to kick things off, uh, Kelsey and I are gonna talk about why you should participate in open source. And then uh, uh, Chris Anacek and I are gonna discuss how you can participate in open source. Then we've got Dean Wampler to, to come and talk about how you can grow your own open source community. Um, and finally, Jared Dillon's gonna provide a case study in, in how he took all the things we're gonna be talking about to help open source the Kudo project. Um, I thought I'd start real quick a little bit about me. I'm co-founder of D2IQ, uh, one of the co-creators of the Apache Mesos project. Um, I had the privilege, privilege of, of serving on the, the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation, CNCF, inaugural uh, technical oversight committee, which was a ton of fun, and, and I love to continue to help mentor open source projects. Kelsey uh, has been a prolific speaker, writer, advocate for all things Cloud Native and, and Kubernetes. Um, and you know, Kelsey, I think one of the things that we love about you is that you really dig into open source and pick it all apart um, before you help explain it back to other people. And it makes it much, much easier to understand and comprehend. And I think that's one of the things that everyone really recognizes and, and, and loves about the, the work that Kelsey does. So Kelsey, stoked to have you on um, uh, doing another kind of fireside chat. That's the fire we did the last <laughs> fireside chat with. So It looks great, by the way. Still have, that's a little hot now in the summer to do that. So, uh, you know, that last time was winter. Anyway, I thought since we're talking about open source, it'd be fun to just start with um, one of your early earliest memories working with open source, um, doing open source stuff. Uh, yeah, I grew up in open source, I would say. I think when I first got into tech, I can remember going to uh, this thing we used to call bookstores, right? These physical buildings you go in to actually buy physical books. And I remember I was learning uh, FreeBSD. So, you know, before I knew about Linux, I knew about the FreeBSD community. And I remember the book came with a CD that you could like install on a computer. And it wasn't just the fact that the software was free and I could download it, is that the information that went with it was also free and open. And I could also contribute and write my own program. So my first interaction with open source was onboarding into this profession. That's awesome. Did you, uh, did you ever think then when you were re reading those real books? Because I remember them as well. I loved them so much. I he'll still have stacks of them. Did you ever think that you'd one day be an author of one of those books? Actually, no. I, I thought that was something that was uh, something that you had to maybe start programming at four to be able to get to the point where you could do that. So I didn't, I didn't buy that book until I was almost 20. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Cool. So, okay, open source. It's 2020. Um, is there still a debate on whether or not organizations should be adopting open source? Yeah, we hear this question come up from time to time, and I don't, I don't think it's actually a question. Uh, you're using open source, uh, whether you do it intentionally or not. Most likely, the phone in your pocket is probably built with a bunch of open source software. 
I'm pretty sure this platform we're talking on right now uh, is leveraging a bunch of open source. The real question is, how do you want to participate in it? You know, do you want to be a consumer of open source, you know, rely on the other things that people build? Or do you want to have some say in the future in the direction of those projects, right? So I think it's one of these things now, it's more about how, do, how should I participate in open source given that I'm already using it? Yeah, totally. And you know, you you, you talk a bit about um, um, you know participating consumer versus versus really producing. Why is participating so important? Why you know, like why should we be participating in open source? What why who's that helping? Is that helping us? Is it helping other people? Yeah. So this is one profession that I think is super unique compared to the other professions, right? If you're a plumber, you kind of use the tools of the trade. Uh, maybe you go buy them off the shelf and very rarely do you get to uh, decide how those tools should be built, how they should work. There's going to be a few inventors amongst the plumber profession. But in our profession, a lot of times the tools we need are meant to kind of glue and uh, solve very unique problems, maybe for a unique set of time. And there's a couple of ways we can go about it. One is you can try to find the perfect piece of software for all of your needs. Right. Most companies are probably running hundreds of various software applications. And one thing that we all know from doing this is that it's almost impossible <laughs> to find a piece of software that just works 100% the way you want, whether it's from the UI, how it looks and feel, or the workflows that it provides, or how it integrates to how your company works. There's always this bit of a delta between the thing you buy and what you want to do. In the open source world, you actually have the opportunity to change the software to meet your particular needs. And I think that's where the real game changer is. So for people that have found a way to not only download these free and open source projects, but to write code and contribute, there's a couple of ways you can go about that. One is sometimes the whole benefit is just to scratch your own itch. You download the software. Maybe you keep your changes local and private to yourself. Uh, that's great. But if you think about being a good open source citizen, this stuff should come full circle. There are times where the fact that you could download someone else's work and maybe build on top of that, it would be nice to reciprocate that and share your work with others to allow this stuff to become sustainable. Yeah, so, so you know, I, I, I'd love it if, if you could, could dig in a little bit on, um, you know, the, the, the dilemma that I feel like a lot of people hit with open source where they, they found some software which maybe out there is 75% what they need but it's not enough. And then they kind of have this option, right? They build the whole thing themselves or they figure out how to engage with the community. And I think some people sometimes are turned away from, you know, engaging with the community and then we either rebuild things from scratch or, or, or you know, don't make the existing software better. You know, what are some, 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 some words, some thoughts that you have for, for how people can, can navigate that, that situation? This comes up a bit because I think a lot of people traditionally have bought software from a large provider, right? So the sustainability became, as long as it's from a big company, they'll be around long enough for me to continue to buy that software and get support. Uh, what we've seen though over time though is that sometimes there is no motivation for that big vendor to push you forward, push what you can do forward. So it gets into this life cycle of you bought this software 15 years ago and it changes very little. What we actually see is that innovation happens outside of your one particular vendor. <laughs> Innovation happens outside of your particular wall. So what happens is when you look at the large array of software that's available, no one's really stopping to check on how fast they can go, right? It, can I move at the pace of Oracle? Can I move at the pace of Google? A lot of times people are just moving at the pace of their own needs or what other people need outside of those ecosystems. So I think when you kind of look and you pay attention to that, you almost have no choice but to pay attention to what tools become available and make a point in time decision. Is it time for me to leverage that? And if it makes sense, you can bring it in. So I think it's one of those things where we don't necessarily control the pace of technology, but we can totally be left behind if we keep our head in the sand and try to pretend that we can live in our own technology islands and then look up every once in a while, you might find yourself left behind. Yeah, totally. I, I, I know, um, you know, you, 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 you know, from conversations you and I have had, you talk about, you know, there's there's really smart people at Google and there's really smart people at lots of other companies as well. And, uh, you know, if, if you if you don't pay attention, um, every company 
leverages somebody else's piece of open source. Um, yeah, it's just a big menu available, and uh, it's not up to you to decide uh, what people get to see and or adopt. Yeah, totally. So you know, you, you talked to you mentioned this a little earlier, and I, I thought we we dig into it a little bit more because I think it it ends up being one of the interesting parts of open source. Um, you know, sometimes people talk about open source software. Um, sometimes people talk about open source communities um, that have open source software. Um, and, 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 and really, you know, there's also this question of there's people consuming just part of the community, consuming it or just consuming open source software. And then there's people that are ultimately producing open source software. Um, and I don't know, sometimes I feel like there's a stigma around, you know, you're not really doing a good enough job if you're also not producing, you know, if you're consuming, you're just kind of a leech, you know. So I, I'm curious you know, your thoughts on the dynamic of just, just open sourcing versus creating open source communities, just being a consumer versus having to produce. Yeah, this is an area where I probably get in trouble uh, with the, the purists in the open source community. I believe that open source doesn't require a logo doesn't require a community, it doesn't require a conference, and it actually doesn't even require co collaboration. I think there's a situation where just the act of sharing, right? Some people write a white paper and say, here's our case study of how we solved a particular set of problems. Uh, some people will back that case study with software in a way that says, hey, look, we're gonna share this software. We are not going to review your issues. We are not going to try to figure out to take your features and involve it. And having that as an option will allow more companies to share because it is a monumental effort in some cases, especially for very popular projects. If you think about projects like Kubernetes, Android, TensorFlow, and most of the programming languages out there, it's just nonstop in terms of feature requests, code that needs to be reviewed and merged. And a lot of times that's not what people are signing up for. So there's always this option of sharing what you've built, allowing people to fork that software. So this is why I think it's important in the open source community to have these licenses that allow people to take that software and modify a had sees fit, removing the burden from you because maybe that's not what you signed up for, but you still wanna give the foundation for innovation for other people so they're not starting from scratch. Now there's another world where you do wanna grow adoption. Now this is where you have to be very careful about sustainability. <laughs> a lot of people will launch a brand new project and they don't think about what happens when we no longer use the project ourselves. Will we still want to be signing up for maintenance? Will we still want to own the logo and the trademark? Those are things that don't really creep into the picture until long term, maybe two or three years, maybe even five years after a project is gone. And what happens when the people that started the project are no longer interested? So having a plan for that. And I think later on in the day, uh, we'll talk about foundations and other efforts to make these projects super sustainable. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, we're gonna dive in with Chris and hear all about what possible licenses you might want to pick. And and yeah, you know, it, it's it, it's interesting. I, I like that you you call out that maybe with some of the open source purists out there, you you uh, you might clash and and the perspective of hey, just just share. Um, but you know, I I I think that the reality is is and and I I know you 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 and I've chatted about this and you said this as well. Open source is it's an ongoing science experiment. Right, you know, and and by sharing, um, it it enables other people to possibly build on your results, right? You know, see your scientific method, and and uh, and I think if it's really clear how you've shared that you're sharing and saying, hey, you know, <laughs> it's it's one of the rare places where I'm reminded that humans as a whole tend to care about each other. We tend to want the best for each other, regardless of our differences. And the fact that software really doesn't, you know, talk back to us, it doesn't hold any opinions. It's one place still, maybe arts is another, music is another, but it's one place where we don't necessarily have to compete for winner takes all. There are things that we come up with in this world that are worth sharing with other people, especially tools that allow them to continue to do that the same. So I think when you think about software, the very act of writing it, it's a way of serializing a lot of our ideas in a way that can be used by others. Speech is another way that we do this. We serialize our ideas into books, into movies. Um, and we talked about it before where not a lot of people can make movies because the equipment required, the lights, the cameras, all the people who need to know how to do it, the editing process. It's super hard, the bar is so high when you look at a blockbuster movie to create things at that caliber. 
But when it comes to software, most of the tools you need to make blockbuster software, right? High-end software that has lots of value, you can do it with a $200 computer. Most of the software is free and open source. Even a lot of the developer tools we use like VS Code and places like GitHub where we can share our content, the bar is so low in terms of resources required to build world-class software that I really believe that anyone writing software today has everything they need to participate at this level. So why not? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, you know, and, and I, I guess along those lines, um, you know, one of, and, and you mentioned this earlier, but I, I thought we'd, we'd dig into it a little bit. I think one of the criticisms from the open source purists on why not to just put software out there is that software is really hard to maintain. Um, and, you know, all of us have had that experience where we've grabbed some piece of software, we've, you know, used it in our project, and then at some point there's been some massive bug and we've reached out to the maintainer, you know, we've reached out to who we expected the maintainer and, and sort of gotten, uh, you know, hey, sorry, like that's, that's you know, not something I'm working on or it's, or it's not my problem. And, and I sort of feel like in those circumstances, there really can be two, two, two things we can do. One is we can say, well, let's participate. Let's, let's you know, fork or evolve that open source project. Or the other one, which I think happens too often, is people are like, this is why I didn't want to use open source software. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, this is the big dilemma. So someone asked, like, how can a large company contribute back to open source? And I think there's so many avenues. One, there's going to be the avenue of, you know, you could hire people from these open source communities. I know so many people who contribute to open source who would love to work on it full time. So you can imagine hiring people from these communities. Let's say you're relying on an open source database to store all your critical data. And there are many ways to go about making sure that that project is sustainable. There are some companies who have taken on maybe hiring one or two people from the community and giving them a full time paycheck where they can continue to contribute. Maybe you have to figure out the ratio. Maybe they do 70 percent pure open source work and maybe 30 percent. They're your expertise within your four walls to make sure you're leveraging that project in a way that most support contracts can never meet. The other way, I think, is to make sure that if there's a way to sponsor other bug fixes, um, anything that you need. I think there's ways of doing things like security reviews. Uh, a lot of companies have said, hey, is this software secure? Well, we can answer that question. One way to answer that question is you can pay for independent security audit. And once it's done, not only does that give you the satisfaction and trust you need, it does it for the whole community. So one company can sponsor this work for thousands of other companies. And these are just simple ways that you can actually step up to the plate and ensure that each project that you rely on are sustainable and when you step back from it there's a couple of things one is what we've seen so far over time a lot of times these open source projects are actually better than the commercial options that are available and then second the amount of uh, I guess innovation and the pace that they're on it doesn't rely on you to try to figure it out by yourself and it doesn't rely on one vendor to figure everything out by themselves so so far these projects have stood the test of time and you can do a lot to make sure that they're sustainable. Yeah, totally. And I, I, I think it's true. You know, there's, there's definitely a, um, one of the things in, in my experience is that when you do dig in to an open source project, it's often you find other people that then come out and say, you know, I was thinking about doing that too. And communities can quickly form. Sometimes it just takes that first step, that first leap of, you know what, let's, let's put some more time and effort into this and other people, other people rally around. So always a reminder of just of, of just trying. Um, one of the things you just mentioned that that I thought would be would be fun to, to hear your perspective on is, do you think foundations will change in the future? You know, do you think that um, we will change the way we think about where we put code and how we maybe even pay for developers to work on that code? You sort of alluded to you know you can pay some open source developers, you can work with foundations. Um, do you still think engineers will be at companies working, you know, 70% time on open source and 30% time on, or do you think maybe we'll get to a world where you've got developers working 100% time and nonprofit organizations like Linux Foundation or something else and, and, uh, and just working on open source? Yeah, I think for where we are as a society, um, if you think about it, I, I know most foundations don't believe themselves to be this way. Uh, but they kind of reflect our current society, right? They kind of reflect like, you know, almost like Netflix model. As long as people pay into this collective, the software can freely flow. 
And it's also a good way to make things sustainable. And in some cases, with very little effort from the consumers outside of paying into the foundation. And I know a lot of people say, oh, that sounds bad. But the honest truth is, sometimes it's the most convenient structure to have a proxy, collect revenue, and make sure that all the projects supported by that particular entity are sustainable. And I think as a society, that's probably uh, the best suited for the way we currently work. There might be a time where you know we all have to pay attention where a lot of this work may be taken up by the bigger cloud providers. It may be taken up by some of the biggest uh, companies out there because a lot of these companies are now showing up and they're building some of the most innovative software. They're paying for the engineering talent. And now we just have to keep an eye on their ability to keep it sustainable. Again, if they were to lose interest, who's going to pick it up and take ownership of these projects? And I think that's just what we have to pay attention to. So the current model, I think it's good for now. Uh, but I honestly think at some point, I can see where larger government entities get involved and say, hey, some of this stuff is just necessary for the government to function. It's necessary for citizens to function. And they may see themselves also sponsoring these open source projects, just like we sponsor roads, airports, and other utilities. I love that. Yeah, there's, there'll be the, the Department of Transportation and the Department of Open Source. You heard it here first, right? No, there sure. you go. <laughs> sure, lots of people are excited about that. Um, but that, that's, that's a perfect segue into um, uh, really the, the last phase I thought we'd talk about, which is, you know, the conference um, today is, is uh, um, United States Air Force Platform One, um, uh, working with the government. I know you've done a ton of things with the government. It's, I've had the pleasure of working and, and doing a ton of things with the government. Um, you know, I, I honestly, I, I think it, you know, it's a testament to the fact that this conference is going on and a lot of the work that we've done to see uh, see people in the government really stepping up and embracing open source in, in a big way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you have any particular thoughts, uh, maybe you have a ton, <laughs> um, about, you know, how, how people think about open source in the government's uh, perspectives you have specifically for government organizations trying to leverage and or contribute back to open source? Yeah, I would say, you know, as a U.S. citizen, um, we're, we're really proud of our country when we see things like the, the moon landing, when we see innovation at a scale that we know only a large collective can never execute on. Those things really amaze us and wow us. And when we think about some of the technology we live with today, a lot of it does come from the governments because sometimes they're the only entities big enough to do it. The internet is one good example of a large entity being able to kick off some global phenomenon that we have now. But when you think about open source today uh, and the opportunity that even the government has is we always talk about uh, the pace of things like, you know, let's think about during wartime, right? We try to build the biggest planes, the biggest ships. But I think there's also this responsibility from the military during time of peace, right? When there's a peacetime, you still have all of these people, you still have all this potential for innovation. And I think during peacetime is where we can really, really double down and invest in things like open source. And when we say open source, we're not just talking about writing random code for random reasons. We're typically talking about solving problems that society has whether that's security problems, whether that's agriculture, how we grow food, how we monitor food, all of these particular problems have the potential to be combined with automation and technology. And a lot of times the glue between our ideas and the hardware that executes them is the software in between. And that software in between, I think, is where government bodies, military, all of these people can participate because they understand these problems at that scale. So imagine taking those brightest minds and having them solve these large problems with that marriage of software and idea. And I think that's just where the potential is. Yeah, that's, that's really, really exciting to think about. Um, it, it, it was really fun to, to watch. Um, I don't know if you watched, I'm sure you did, but uh, NASA and, and, and SpaceX uh, uh, this summer, that was definitely a highlight for me and, and it did. It, so it took me back to um, you know a lot of memories of growing up as well of uh, thinking of all that and you know one of the reasons why I've always been a huge advocate for supporting the government and, and, and all all the great work work that they're doing. Okay, um, I think we'll we'll wrap it up now. Um, any final thoughts that you'd love to share? I um, uh, really appreciate you coming on and and kind of giving perspectives on 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 you know why we really need to be participating in open source 
And um, I'd love for you to share any final thoughts and, and then we'll, uh, we'll do a big Q&A uh, at the end as well. Yeah, I think a lot of us have great ideas, but you know they don't really go very far unless people can see them and benefit from them. So I think open source is one great way to channel your ideas into something that's tangible that can benefit society as a whole. Awesome, Kelsey. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you doing this chat with me. We'll be doing the QA later. And um, uh, we'll be back in just a second with uh, Chris to transition from you know, why you should really be participating in open source to, to how you can do it. Um, so be back in just a sec, everybody. <laughs> 